Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be back here and continue our study in the book of Job. I hope everyone has the um, English translation in your paper. Tonight I'm going to use a little different translation because this chapter is kind of different. Um, uh, and therefore, um, uh, I'm using um, my translation. Um, just a very short word of introduction. Uh, what left by the end of chapter 2 is the, the end of Shiva. What does that mean? As you know, we have in the Jewish law and in custom the concept of Shiva. We bury our loved one, and upon completion of burial, we, we formulate the two um, lanes, and, and the mourners pass through those, and we, this is the first time we give the word of comfort. And then they get home, um, we prepare for them a special Seudat Avra'a with eggs and neighbors and friends prepare for them. And then they sit Shiva. It's a seven days period. They're sitting on the low bench. They tear the garments earlier and they light candles. And they, as we learned last time in the book of Job, um, they sit in a very um, painful, silent mode. And when we... Uh, follow the Jewish tradition and Jewish law, we, meaning the people who come and comfort them, not supposed to begin the conversation. The mourners need to begin their talk and we basically respond and show our uh, feeling to them. So the last line, the last verse in last week, we, um, we uh, read the last two psukim. We said that the, 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 his best friends, Job, Job, have several good friends and what's more than when you know who are your real good friends in the time of crisis, that they get together and they, um, they just, with him, they just tore the garments and they, they put the ashes at the top of their heads and they are totally broken hearted. And then the text said that they sat with him on the ground for a period of seven days and seven nights. That's the concept of Shiva. Seven days and seven nights, they just sat with him. But in the way that the text described, they said, no one said a word to him, for they saw that his pain was such an excruciating pain, it was so very great, that you reach those points, you have, you have nothing to say. It's, 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 so, it's so sad, it's so painful. And somehow every one of us in so many ways experience um, dealing with people in different level of agony. I can attest in all my years as a rabbi for, for several decades, that you reach sometimes a point that you really, as much as you try to comfort people, you reach a point that is, is no word to say. The, the, the pain is so high, so much, that um, you sit there and you, you just, nothing. You can't say anything because anything you said can cause them even more some type of agony. And the text said it, <clears throat> Beautifully, they said, the end of very love davar, the last uh, t two lines on the chapter, they said, no one of his friends can say anything because because they saw the pain is so great, it's so excruciating, they, they, they have nothing to say, you know. The man was wealthy, was healthy, have a family, have a wife and children and everything, and all of a sudden he lost everything and it's nothing worse for a person to bury his child. Nothing worse for a person to, you know, people can give away a state, money, whatever it is, they don't mind. But when it's come to the, the even, even the whole health, some people can go over that somehow, okay. But children, this is something that no normal person in the right mind can go over that with just a regular pain. This is a pain that's undescribable. So they said that they, they, um, they Achareichen patach Yov et piu. So only then Job opened his mouth after all and unfortunately by Kalelet Yomo and he cursed his day. So there are a few points before we begin the chapter 3. Is, um, we learn the concept of Shiva, which is the, the period of seven days, seven nights, that the friends also partake of that. We learn also the idea that the mourners should start the conversation first. But we learn also that people, it's called in a Talmudic language, Ein Adam Nitpas Bishat Sa'aro. 
when a person is in a tremendous pain, they can say a lot of things that later on they regret it, later on they feel bad about it, but when people reach those moments, they can say a lot of things that are very inappropriate. And um, again, I can show a little um, experiences that when I used to visit people in the all kind of um, ICU, hospitals, uh, you see people in certain moments of their lives, they can say things that it's undescribable and, and unrepeatable. It's just, and you know many of them later on regret it. But here it's a righteous man, it's a man that uh, the text describes him as a man of God, they, they, he did everything right. Now he's so frustrated that he cursed his day, which means he basically regretted the, regret the concept that he was even born. So in that sense, if you remember the first week we asked a question, namely, how come in our prayer we said, Baruch Ata Hashem, bless are you God, Magen Avram, shield of Abraham. And we ask a question, how come we don't say it, shield of Noah, shield of Job. And in our little understanding we compare those biblical stories and we see as much as um, Job was a great man, but he reaches limitations. And when that happened, he, he behaved a different way. Abraham withstand even this level of pain while Job couldn't take it anymore. He started cursing. So at the beginning of chapter 3, it's such a, a painful vayan yov vayomar and Job spoke up and he said, so you see here the concept that the mourners speaks first. We just sit there and our job is just to listen. And he said, and now he cursed the day. Um, and in a way it's the first round of discussions because um, he is now about to curse the day that he was born. So, um, in the deepest level, we're getting close to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And as you know, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, one of the highest moments is on the Sun of Tokiv. It's the time that we open the Ark, the Oran Kodesh, and, and um, we said that the books are open and the Almighty um, review our lives and, 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 and decided who should live, who will die, who will be in a good um, prosperity, healthy and, and not. So there is a beautiful text that we said at that time, um, um, there is a total silence, which means that it will reach a point that all the pleroma, all the, those entities around God have nothing more to say. They said, Bashofar Godoli Taka, we hear the sound of the shofar. And after that, it's total silent, which means there is a point that we are reach a awe of amazement. The real in our language, God is there, that is nothing to say. It's almost like you go to court and the judge is just reading again before he making his verdict. You're just there to, to, to be there and not say much. So what did he say? He said, Yovad Yom Ivaleidbo. Lost be the day when I was born. gavel. And the night when it was announced. So what he said? He said here, I, I, in a way, I, I'm sorry that I was even born. Why is that? So obviously, the, the simple um, a explanation is, um, since I don't see the purpose of my life, and I don't know why I'm here, because people, when they reach certain point in their lives, they start thinking, why I'm here? Why I was born to a certain family? Why, why, what is my call here? But there is a certain point that um, the person starts asking himself, so why I'm around? What's the purpose of my life? Since I lost everything, and since I, I, I don't see a goal and purpose all my life, um, so why I'm here? So he went to the next step, which is he curse even the day that he, 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 he get the chance to be born. So he's almost saying, I'd rather not born to this than born and I have no clue what to do with this life. Unfortunately, um, you see people who, who behave like that, that they, they cannot take the pain anymore and they just start um, cursing the day that they are around. Now, if you look carefully, he's not 
yet in the stage of blaming God or blaming some, because that's the pattern. The next step you start blaming. He is not there yet. He just feels so embittered and so sad that he is cursing the day. Now, we should remember what we said at the very beginning. There are two different opinions. Who is Job? There is an opinion that he was never born. He's never a character. It's just the, the author tried to bring a protagonist that uh, illustrates people's behavior. There is another view that was a real person. Most of the rabbis said was not even a Jewish person who went through that. So regardless if he's a real person or not, for our discussion is the mindset of people and a certain behavior, which is fascinating. People behave in a certain way when they have wealth and prosperity and success and everything else. But you watch on TV, people react to Irma, the hurricane, and you see the reaction. You can analyze. The people change. People start talking differently when, when sudden crisis befall on them. And the, the whole real person, real character, discover at the, those moments how really you react or respond to crisis. So he is basically cursed the day that he was born. He said that he was born, and he said, that day, Hayomahu, that day, may that day ye choshech, which is, he said, it's become dark. And unfortunately, when I study it, and I think many of you will feel the same, we <laughs> match some people we know that have this type of feeling when, when, when they, they approach sadness. And one of the beauty in study of the book of Job, or study Judaism at large, is the idea that we find hope, we find a spot that we can look up and see a better future. Um, the beauty in Jewish faith, the beauty in Judaism is the, that we, even the lowest moment, we always have something that we look forward, that is something that we see that there is some future. When a person curses the day that he was born and really see a blockage in his total no future, then it's, um, it's kind of um, very low, maybe the lowest um, moment of a person, that everything is bad, everything is negative, and I'm sorry that I was even born here. Now, try to analyze this Job, this Job, just, just two chapters ago, which can be a short time earlier. In the way we describe it, it was just a matter of, of weeks. That he was very wealthy, with prosperity, with home, with wife and children and everything. And, and bless God and bring sacrificial offering and pray and do all these things. And just because everything turned around, his whole personality, his whole mindset, his whole psyche is in total different modes. And again, we can analyze that and feel how far is our faith. In a way, the rabbis describe a gradation, a different level of faith, how far there are people who have faith only if you quote them or only if they fear of punishment, we said last week, last time. But this one, he reached a point, look at sentence four, what he said. He said, may darkness and the shadow of death sully it, may a, a cloud rest upon it, may it be terrified by the demons of day. That's a very strong statement. He said, that day, that um, it's so dark, that um, he cursed the day he was born. And he said that the, the Almighty should not even, as you know, when we believe when a baby is born, there are three entities, which is the father and mother, and obviously God, because without God, there's no father and mother. So we said that there is the three, the Talmud said there's the three partner of creation. So he said, all those who created me, which indirectly even referring to God, but he used the term, Al Yidreshehu Elohami Ma'al, which means, um, may, may the, 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 the Almighty or, or the one, the Omnipresent, will not even visit that subject, why it was a decision to have me born. Which, um, again, he feels such a level of, of depression, such a level of sadness, that he, he just said that he was even born to all of that. And again, this is something that we, we have to ask ourselves, what happened to people? What happened to people? It's you only serving the highest purpose when everything is lovely and, and great. 
You see, when, when I know it's hard, but for some people who study the Shoah, study the World War II, study the people behavior in certain concentration camp. So if you read a book by Viktor Frankl, the great Dr. Frankl, Professor Frankl, um, who was a, um, unfortunately in a concentration camp and uh, he became one of the role models in psychotherapists and neuropsychologists and won a lot of award. He, he was the one who, who described a pattern of behavior, total, the same people, total different behavior when they are in the camp, when people losing their loved one, when people reach a point that they accumulate wealth and, and everything else and all of a sudden things shed away from them. And he tried to say in his book, his excellent book, Ben in Search of Meaning. Did you ever read that book? Anybody heard? One? Two? Okay. So it's an excellent book by Professor Viktor Frankl. It's called Men in Search of Meaning. I won, won a lot of award. And even its old book, I read it when I was a kid, but it's still a lot of applications. So he described his capability to be out of the camp and just thinking kind of hope that he is physically there but not emotionally there. So that's being a big person in those moments. Um, unfortunately, that, that trial, that tribulation in the character of Job, he did not pass. He reached those points and he start cursing the day that he was even born. And he said, sentence 5, may thick darkness snatch that night, may it not have joy among the days of the year, may it not come upon the count of the month. So it means that um, he said that um, the whole purpose of me being created, he, he recognized that there is God, he recognized that there is a purpose. But since he reached that low point in his life, he regret that, that, that he was born. He regret that he is part of that. Um, the way we try to be positive, we try to think that because he is not in those moments of understanding why he was born, he didn't understand that this type of, of trial or this type of, of, of situation it will be only temporary and it's not going to be forever because he reached that point he was he was bitter and and he said he just keep saying about the darkness how lonely i am how f terrible i feel how um, look at the world may this bite be desolated may no joyful song come to it may those who are cursed the day it curse it and so those who are aroused in those uh, their mourning so um, in sentence seven, he just described his loneliness. Um, he described it in a sense like Galmud, is like woman that um, deserted one. Um, the husband left it, and uh, or uh, the husband is akar, which means she tried to be pregnant and she never had the chance to have a baby. So um, he is basically said in our simple language, I wish that my parents never end up the chupa, I never have cohabitation to have me born to this world. And he continued and he said, um, now we go to the level of, of strongest curse, and he said, may twilight start be dim, may it curve light but none, may it not see the glimmer of dawn. So he is basically cursing. Um, 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 this is people who reach level of depression and bitterness in such a way that they, they, they cursed everything, that they cursed the day that... that um, so, in a sense, if you try to be positive, you can say that it happens because he doesn't understand the purpose of life at this stage. He doesn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. He sees so much darkness and is, is no hope. Um, imagine, I'm going back 30 years, 35 years ago, we have a Lebanon war. The first Lebanon war was, was a mess, as you know as you may have read. Um, you get to the bunker in Lebanon and every couple of hours you get a different orders. And you don't know if you survive and how you survive. And most of those uh, IDF units did not return uh, at peace. Many of the soldiers lost the part of the body or lost their lives. But you're sitting there in a bunker and you have no idea. Uh, today is Rosh Hashanah. Today is Pesach. 
when, where, how, there's no way to uh, give you the basic supply, there's no way of communication, you don't know how it ends, the group fighting against each other, and, um, and there's a snakes around, and a very limited amount of food and water, and you don't know who and what, so you, you don't see a, a light at the end of the tunnels, you don't know how things will turn around the next. And unfortunately, it happens a lot throughout the life of our people. If you look at us as extended family, as a nation, you see what happened to us. Uh, some of us experienced Vietnam, some of us experienced World War II. So you see that th those moments, low moments, um, in our Jewish extended family, Jewish life, happen a lot. Uh, it's not always like, now, thank God that uh, we're in 2017, and thank God people have their homes, people have food to put on the table, people have their families, there's a communication world. Uh, you know, all these things didn't happen throughout the time. We, we suffer from a lot of loneliness and a lot of darkness, individually and collectively. So you see a certain reaction of people, a certain pattern of behavior. So he said in sentence 9, Yecheshvu Chochvenishpo, which is, is a, this is a very strong sentence. It says, for no one closed the portal of my womb to hide misery from my eyes. So he's basically um, um, speaking about the, um, the, um, the moment that kind of I open my eyelid, open, I open my eyes. And that day it's a curse. Kilo zarkarda tel bitni v'yaster amal me'enai. So sentence 10 said that why did I not die from the womb, not expire as I came from, forth from the belly? So he is going back to that, that moment that he was even born. My mother have a great sorrow to have me come to this world for what purpose? What is the result of all of that? So because he is so sad, he built up certain things and everything just crashed in the front of his eyes, um, his level of faith changed, his level of belief and understanding the world changed, which is a fascinating subject to study. You see Christianity deal a lot with the book of Job, because not only Christianity, but the many faith groups dealing with the idea of faith. How far you have faith, you have a little faith, you have a high faith, how so, uh, uh, tracking yourself in your level of faith, it's always only in a time of agony and crisis. To keep faith when everything works well, that's the claim of the Satan, the first chapter. It's kind of easy, in a sense, why not? If you have everything you wish to, it's easy. The, I said the first week, um, it's nothing against Joe Austin or other Christian preachers. The co key problem we see it is, is a it's a Jewish uh, teachers and clergy, is um, in a study of faith, in the study of, of, of religion, we ap approach not only the time of prosperity and, and everything goes in our way, but to believe that God has us in the palm of his hand, even we are in the worst crisis moment that we really don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And he asked those questions, sentence 11, how come, lama lo merechet why did the knee come to meet me. Why were the breasts there for me to suckle? It just go on and on and on. Should I will be lying, call me to my grave, I'll be asleep, then I'll be at rest. So here, indirectly, he's dealing also with the idea of cemetery. Um, and this is something that um, um, we, should, we should talk at least in, in, in a little, little bit. Um, when we are kids in elementary school, we understand the whole concept of biblical characters or life or end of life in one way. As a mature adult, we understand, um, at least in observing on some levels Jews, we understand that the end of life is not by the end of life. Meaning the fact that the person is um, physically and no longer among the living doesn't mean that it's the end of the story. In, in our faith group, it's the beginning of a story. It's the belief that the um, spirit never died, the, the, the soul never died. You bury the person, so the body is buried. But we're saying Kaddish, and we're saying Yizkor, and we're saying prayer, and we do all of this because we know 
in our belief is the spirit never die. So here is the concept that people, some people think, oh, if I die, everything will be lovely. But in Jewish faith, you see it also in Islam and Christianity too. It's not. It's you have the heavenly court, you have the idea of you need people to say for your prayer and everything because it's a heavenly tribunal. We believe, like many other faith groups, that there are souls that need to return. So in a sense, do not think by ending life shortly or by asking to, be, uh, to end physical life, that solve all the problem. That's very deep philosophical, theological po point that people need to understand. People who consider or even thinking about, God forbid, suicide or shorten life of person, etc., not only is not in the spirit of Judaism, but that's not solve the problem. That's not going to be the solution. It's not going to be there because he basically go the whole idea that what happened after you bury? After you bury the person, he is, the soul needs again to give an account to all his life and go on and on. So he said at the cemetery, it's not, go, go sentence 14, 16, 18, just give you the abbreviation. He said, um, um, he was some sentence, together with kings and counselor of the world, who uh, rebuilt rooms for themselves with the ministers who have gold and filled the house with silver. So basically he hold here, he said that um, unfortunately um, uh, people who build the wealth and they think that the wealth will go with them and all their life they keep saying, I hope you don't know too many because I know too many people who say that my money, my property, my accomplishment, my, my, me, me, me. It's not just narcissists. There are people like that, that they believe that they'll never die. They name their estates after themselves and they just, all their life, they try to accumulate more and more of themselves and they think that they'll live forever. Um, I don't want to go to politics, so I'm not going more on that. Anyway, so the next thing is, I don't imply to anyone, don't look at my... I just say, I don't want to go to politics. So anyway, so um, he said, look at sentence 15. He says, oh, I've liked the concealed uh, a, a stillborn, being alive like infant who uh, never saw light. So what did he mean by that? He said that there are people who um, accumulate wealth in such a level that they're so occupied with that, that that's basically supposed to make them happy. And it's not. He says because it's, it's like Nephel. Nephel in Jewish law, it's a baby up to 30 days old. It's not a human in a Jewish law. Meaning the halakha, the Jewish law saying, you can have a pidyon aben, you can have a redemption of the firstborn baby boy when he passed 30 days. Any baby that die prior to 30 days period, he um, is basically not, you don't treat that baby in the same law of mourning as you treated a mature uh, baby that passed the 30 days. It's called Nephil. So he said, i rather be like a Nephil. i rather die like that and not reach the next level. So he said, Sham Reshaim, sentence 17. Uh, the captives all together are tranquil. They're not here of a uh, t uh, test mask uh, uh, a voice. So, um, he basically said, why I want to go back to the moment that uh, I was born and I wish not to be born? Because the moment I was born, I have to give an account. And it means that even I die, that will not solve my problem. I still need to give an account. I need, still need to go through all this process. So I rather not born at all. That's a, a deep idea. And he said, sentence 19 teaches another lesson. It says, why does he give light to the sufferer and life to those who bitter in soul. So why is that? Because we said small and great are equal there. There's a common mistake that people think that if someone is well praised in this world, it means that in the world to come, the same. It's a famous story in the Talmud about one of the rabbis that have a clinical death. And he came back to the Beit Midrash, to the house of studies. And all the other colleagues said, what, did you, what happened there? And he said, guess what? I saw people who we praise so much in this world, they're nothing. And people who are treated here like nothing are big over there. 
So it means many times in our way that we appraise the value of people is very different than the real way that they, the Almighty will see what's in people's heart. It's, it's very different. So God knows deeply what happened in the person's heart. And therefore, some people whom we value as the most important people are not, and vice versa. So therefore, he said that since I reached this point that are all equal in the eye of the Lord, and I'll, I'll never be free from everything else, and because this befall upon me, who knows what's going to be the next step. And this again is a level of faith. In the Jewish faith, we have this belief, if you see someone who suffer here, many comfort and said that uh, one of my best friends gets a, uh, should never happen to anyone, you have 11 kids and you have sudden cancer at the age of 50. And he died 51 years old. You're like 10 months of chemotherapy, horrible. Left grieving wife and 11 kids, babies, everything. Was athletic, was, one Friday night he came to my house, I said, this is not him. He is like talking nonsense. I couldn't believe. They took him to the, to the Hadassah hospital. And Saturday night, he's already in a different planet. The, not talking, you don't understand the conversation. So I came there. I was the first person to get there. And he said to me, you know, we have to accept the judgment. We, we don't know why things happen. But the, the, the idea, he tried to convince me that it's better to be punished in this world and then upon burial you kind of reach Olam Abad, you will be in a peaceful world. How many of you watched the movie by Mitch Album, uh, Five People You Meet in Heaven? Anyone watched it? One? Two? I was very attached to that movie, it touched me. Um, because it's, it's a lot of Jewish teaching from that, that movie. It's basically in imaginations what happened upon burial, how, how things start folding up and understanding why things happen that you'll never be able to understand during this life. But suddenly, he called it five people you meet in heaven. It's like regression therapy. And suddenly you understand why you meet certain people and why Think, certain things happen during your lifetime and what's the purpose. Here he said, since it's all equal and is no such a thing freedom because he said, and the slave is free from his master, which means we do not have to do mitzvot, we don't have to do the service of God the way we're doing here, yet we need to give account. So therefore he said, why does the Almighty give light to the sufferer and life to those who bitter of soul? So he's now start asking questions about um, God's treating certain people in theory. He says, like uh, 21, he says, For those who crave death, but it is not there, who seek is more e eagerly than hidden treasure. So now he's the point that he's like, why God did not grant me with death while he granted that to other people, right? So again, this is different level of... Um, of uh, expression of bitterness, that he is um, um, kind of imagination, this type of feeling that um, um, from a point of speaking about himself and his personal crisis, he's now talking about society, about people. How come certain people was taken um, uh, before they reach those point of suffering and other people, the God let them suffer for such a long time? Is this is a very common question. You see people reaching a, a certain age and they, 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 the life is so miserable and there's no quality of life. And you see day in and day out and you ask yourself, so why do they need to go through that? Why God did not take them? And it's a big question, by the way, in Jewish law, which I don't want to go too much, but just to understand the concept. Since we believe in the power of our prayer, we say Misha Beirach, we say prayer and we believe that that prayer can make a difference, right? So it's a common response that people ask, do we allow to pray for someone to die quickly? You see someone who is in a tremendous excruciating pain and the doctors give up hope and he's, he's, he or she is in, in like a respirator, ventilator or, or, or painkillers or whatever it is and there's no quality of their lives and they're suffering greatly and I'm sure that everyone here know of someone that go through that. 
And then they come to us as the rabbis and ask a question, can we pray that they should die quickly? Which is not a simple question by itself. I'm not going to them, just give you the concept. All right, that Job asked a question, not so much at this point of himself, just try to understand God and try to understand certain pattern of behavior. Why is that judgment? Is, is, uh, he said, look at this frightening sentence 22. He said, we're almost done in the chapter, but see, he said, to a man whose deeds are concealed, before whom the Almighty has raised a barrier. So he said that, that uh, here, because those who exult in joyous occasion, who rejoice when they find the grave, which means they're happy to die eventually because they, they suffer so much. And then we, we, we are in a situation that is all concealed, that it's all unknown. And because we do not understand God, the soul is so much unknown. You remember the first week I told the story about a man that reached 100th birthday? And, and so the, the, this is the idea that if you know even the sad news, the situation, you feel relief. But if you're in a state of unknown and you see people suffering, that's worse because you struggle with understanding why certain things happen. And he said, that's the end of this chapter, he said, because I have such a deep desire for death, because all my body, you remember last week, part of his body is 